Hey, hey guys, episode nine of Kicking Off is upon us and it's with my dear friend, former colleague Kay Murray, an absolute legend who's got a phenomenal story to tell from house hunting and the hardships of her earlier days to hosting the Ballon d'Or, handing Lionel Messi the trophy twice. Kay over the weekend was presenting on ABC for ESPN. She's a phenomenal talent in this industry, a brilliant storyteller and a great laugh as well. Kicking off today with my good pal, Kay Murray. Ah, my old bud, Kay Murray, how are you? I'm great, Kev. It's so funny that you ask, how are you? Like, we speak every day. Yeah. You're like family to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a birthday week for you, isn't it? I know, it's a big one. And do you know what? I love my birthday. In fact, September is my birthday month. It's not just like oh, a birthday. So you're so but it feels. Mind. I know, it's not like, it just feels weird this year. It almost feels like it feels wrong to be celebrating it. And, it, you know, right. I'll enjoy it. But I, I don't know, I love oh, my birthday. But yeah yeah it's just a, it's just been a bad year it doesn't feel like celebrating too much so next year i'll have a big one that's what i'll do instead it's been a strange year hasn't it but uh, i mean for you guys up in connecticut you moved from miami you, you settled in connecticut you're both at espn yourself and mateo doing brilliantly um while also raising a young boy it's been a whirlwind for you hasn't it it really has i have to say it's been tougher than I expected because working from home sounds amazing and it is a blessing first of all it's a blessing to have a job right now in this current climate second of all to be able to work from home when you've got a baby but then that means that everything is happening in the house well the apartment that you're in the baby the studio it's just we're running out of space so we're moving into a house next gen I'm very much looking forward to it what's the most creative thing you've done for your studio because certainly this looks okay in the background but I'm in a dumpy basement here in Atlanta I've got like old moving boxes that I'm holding up my my camera on uh it's hilarious when I look around what's the most creative thing you've done I think I mean even if you could see what I can see now this looks all slick and everything behind me (laughs) this is just a big screen in our bedroom in the corner there is just carnage and mess everywhere else and the funny thing is is that for most of the football things I do it's all it's all ad-libbed anyway as it always was with those guys but I'm doing a sports show now I'm doing sports center and that's sports news and you're talking lots of stats especially because I'm discussing American sports a lot of the time and I don't have a prompter for that usually for a news show you'd have some type of prompter so I have like papers at first the papers were stuck on the window when I was using my living room and now the papers are all stuck on like the tripod the light there's just papers everywhere with notes on it you've got to find a way right hey yeah, you've you got to find a way you were on ABC over the weekend that was unbelievable it was really cool for Meg and I just to flick on what was a channel two and there's Kay hosting the England game as well as the Portugal Croatia game as well how was it for you It was great. I was really happy to be given the opportunity. And I think one of the nice things is that because even though the United States will continue to be my home and has been my home for what now, the last eight years, it still didn't quite hit me, the magnitude of it. Whereas if I were back in England and someone was said, oh, you're going to be on national TV today on BBC or ITV, I'd be like, whoa. And so I think that was actually a good thing because it didn't make it as big as it was or as it could have felt for me, you know? Yeah, but ABC is bigger than BBC. Let's be honest. National Network. No, I, I know you, you were the one telling me that. But you know what? It's like when I did my first Ballon d'Or, the guy in my ear said, okay, three, two, 19 million viewers, one, two, 19 million viewers. Just before we went on, and I thought, why did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> what was he thinking? So I think that having, I, I, I just looked back to that, I thought, okay, you've gone out to a huge global audience before, that was probably a bigger audience, and I just had to put that in my head and, and not think too much about it, because if you get into your own head, that's the worst thing, you know that. Does it make a difference to you, whether it's a million, 19 million, 100,000? Like for me, I don't think it would make a difference in the world. I think when I'm hosting, I look at a crowd in an audience say and that makes me more nervous seeing the actual human reactions rather than looking into a like essentially a a machine with a red light on it i completely agree with you i think it's well actually you know because you did a reading at our wedding and you told me it was one of the nervous Shit. most nervous you've ever been yeah okay. it's so different shaking. yeah it is um so yeah i think i'm a bit the same as you 
uh, because you are behind a camera and the red light and most people write to you on Twitter and stuff. Well, not most people, but a lot of the people that are watching the shows, they'll have been watching you for a while and you chat to a lot of the same people on Twitter. You've never met them, but they're just all soccer fans in America. And so a lot of the time I think, okay, my buds are watching at home. So I'm talking to a room full of them. They're in the living room, they're watching. And that just makes me feel a little bit better sometimes. Certainly, I think surroundings matter. Uh, and when we were at BN Sports, I became so comfortable in that day-to-day role hosting the extra that you knew all the camera crew, you knew your floor manager re- really well, you knew who your analyst was going to be. And in many ways, it's probably like for you now, you'll get to that stage whenever you, you, you get used to the, the team at ESPN. But it's getting that familiarity, isn't it? And just understanding everybody and becoming comfortable in that room. And then you're flying once that happens. Yeah, and also, and so that's a big part, part of it, the chemistry that we had with everybody at BN Sports. Obviously, we built that up. And you also don't want to go in all guns blazing because I've been watching ESPN FC. I've been watching all these guys on digital for years. So you feel like you know the likes of Stevie Nichol and Craig Burley, all of these guys, but you can't act like that when you first meet them. So what was really nice was I do a lot of digital hits with ESPN FC and I've done a lot of those since I started working. So I got to know them before I actually went on main TV with them and that really helped. Nice. Your job now, you're a star, Kay. You're an absolute star and a rising star at that as well. Yet it wasn't always as easy for you as it was maybe for many others. Uh, Most people don't know your story. Your youth is fascinating to me because, am I right in saying you didn't go to college? No, I didn't. I did, but I ended up leaving. Okay, so but then you go back even further. Tell us a little bit about like your childhood. Your parents got divorced. The the trials and tribulations that one day led from essentially house hunting with your mom to hosting the Ballon d'Or. I just think it's one of the most remarkable stories. It's a strange one because I had the most picturesque childhood you could imagine. Uh, everything my mum and dad did for me and my brother and sister was amazing, and so I thought everything was perfect. And then it all came crashing down in my teens when, as you said, my parents got divorced. And I've talked to a lot of other people who've had their parents divorce. And some people who said when it happened a lot younger, they said they were already used to it by the time they were a bit older. And obviously, it's everybody's own experience. But the people that I've found whose parents were divorced in those formative years and their teenage years really did suffer. And that was definitely the case with me and with what happened to our family. And since then, I've seen things like Marriage Story on Netflix. And I know that the guy behind that, he really took his parents' divorce badly. I watched the Amy Winehouse documentary by Asif Kapadia. And if you listen, she took her parents' split really badly. And a lot of what happened with her was because of that and a result of that. And it actually was quite therapeutic to see because I feel like I could, I wish I could go back and hug that 15, 16 year old girl that I was and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. But the discipline then left the household because my dad had gone. And it was a very messy divorce and it it was not friendly at all. And we lost our house and then everything just got really ugly. So the whole family was split. And in the end, even though I went to stay with my friend for a little bit, because my mom and my friend's mom thought, okay, they're going through like a, a big time. We'd just done our GCSEs, you know, college was on the way. It's probably best that she stays with a friend so it doesn't seem too weird. My mom and sister went to my nana's. My brother went with my dad's. It was just a bit of a mess. But now my nana wanted us all together. But my nana was like a, a tough woman, um, my mum's mum. And she softened a little bit as she got older, but she was tough. So we clashed. And we clashed so much that one day I told her what I was thinking. I was, I was very, it was a very difficult time for me as well. And I just don't feel that she had the empathy that she should have had for a teenage girl going through what I was. But the funny thing was, was I had an argument with her and my mum backed me because my mum had obviously grown up with her as a mum, but at that point she told us we had to leave her house and then we had nowhere to stay, we had no house. So essentially my mum and I were homeless. And fortunately in a town where I grew up in Middlesbrough, there were options for us. So we went to live in a hostel for a while and it sounds worse than it is. It was actually really nice, new build, new building and um, met some very nice people there. We were very, privileged for the background that you saw some people who were living there had and the things they'd been through and we had to do that until we got rehoused and this was just a whole new world to me at a strange age so I think that changed a lot of what happened going forward because I just started to think I don't ever want to have to go through something like this 
two things. I want to always make sure that I've got the financial security to look after myself if something happens like this when I'm older. And secondly, when I get married, and like a lot of girls, I grew up knowing that I wanted to marry and I wanted a family unit. I thought when I get married, it has to be right. I can't put my kids through this. And you never know what the future holds, but that definitely shaped a lot of what happened going forward. Wow, that's incredible. It's fascinating you say to me that the, the situation wasn't that bad at all. I mean, uh, you, you naturally reframe in a positive way. I think I remember the day I first met you when I auditioned at BN Sports and you were the most positive person I've ever met. And that like hit me straight away. So even in those dark moments, which will be very dark for a lot of people, you probably still found a laugh every single day. Yeah, absolutely. And I always, <laughs> and I, I can't say whether this is why, but I have always had that sunny outlook. So I always think things are going to be okay because things always were okay in the end. For some people, they say, wow, you were homeless. But guess what? We did find a way to get a roof over our heads until we were rehoused. We did find a way to keep going. I was working. I was studying at college. I just realized it wasn't for me. And I thought, okay, I want to go and do, I want to be in a place where I can be who I want to be. I knew I wanted to be in entertainment. I didn't know when at my age that there would be a pathway for a young woman in sports, but I started to see it. I'm very lucky that as I was turning about 18, 19, women were starting to pop up, especially on football shows in England. And I knew I'd have to go to London, to the capital city to do that. And so I packed my bags and I went with my best friend and she and I just never looked back. Isn't that mental? Tell me, Louise, on the road you go. <laughs> Spencer Owen was on a few weeks ago and he said that, that he said that traditional education just wasn't for him. And he knew straight away. And to be honest, I did too. Like I was bang average in school, bang average in college. And that's, I'm not saying I'm anything but bang average in my career, but I'm saying I think some people just don't have, they look beyond that. I was always interested in being on the, the you know, student council or the football teams or whatever else I could be on to get me out of class. Um, and that's what I always think about now with my son. Like, I'm not going to break myself by trying to put him through college for 25 grand a year here in the US if it's not a right fit. And I think it's just about working out what each human being wants to do and what their strengths are. So I have two ways of thinking about that because I feel like I perhaps missed out and I disappointed a lot of people, which wasn't really fair at the time to put that pressure on me, particularly many of my mm-hmm. teachers, because academics was a big thing for me. I did really well at school. I got great grades. I loved school. I particularly loved being in English. I was very creative. I was always a good writer and I was always involved in the big events. So I think a lot of teachers were disappointed that I didn't go on to study even in the school sixth form at the time and that I was going to look for another college elsewhere. Um, I knew my dad was really disappointed, but he couldn't say too much because everything that had happened, I think that that really shaped what did come next for me. Uh, I do have friends, though, who said, oh, you would have thrived in the university scene. It would have been amazing for you. And I did end up going back to study in my mid 20s. I went back to study journalism, which helped me take another step forward in my career. And I loved it. And so now when I do talk to young people, because I feel that I didn't get the right career advice either, I actually don't give the advice that it's okay if you don't go to college I just keep it open for them because I know there are great avenues that university and college can give young people if they have an idea what they want to do so I try and help them when they ask me with that so on that note you know it's common to get emails saying how did you get to where you are today I want to be a broadcaster what advice do you have for me and you often get those open-ended type emails What advice do you give to people? Because your route is obviously extremely different to most. One of the big pieces of advice that I give um, is to not focus on just one thing. And that does work for some people. Like there are some people who they say, I want to be there at that company and they'll do everything they can to get there. But along the way, other opportunities will present themselves. And that certainly happened with me. And so I took all different avenues and I think it's to never turn down an opportunity to just make sure that as long as you're taking a step forward, for instance, I did shopping television, which is like QVC is probably how most people would know it, but it was called Bid Up TV, the show that I was working on. What were you selling? Everything, fluffy towels, (laughs) cotton sheets, kettles, the lot, you name it. Give us a rattle there, sell us a kettle. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't be. (laughs) But see, this is the thing, Kev. So having to do that with open talk back, live, thinking on your feet, having to sell. And you don't move on to the next lot until everything's sold. 
that really helped me get used to talking in front of the camera, dealing with being under pressure. And that paid my way through journalism college. And I also then came off television because after journalism college, I got offered two jobs at two different newspapers oh. as a trainee reporter. And I took that opportunity and many people were saying, oh my goodness, you're stepping away from television. You know, what are you doing? Because I'd already worked at a club channel with Middlesbrough TV by then. And I said, no, I think that this is the right decision for me. Do you know what? It really turned out to be that. I learned media law. I learned how to source and find a story. I learned how to write copy really well. And it actually really benefited me in, in the role that I have today. So go on then. You go from shopping TV to hosting the Ballon d'Or, handing Lionel Messi the Ballon d'Or trophy <laughs> twice alongside the likes of Sir Alex Ferguson and Rude Hullet. I mean, that's a dream journey, isn't it? At that point in your life, can we just jump to that for a second? Or if you want to tell a story as to how you got there. I'm dying to know about those nights and the glitz and the glamour of a Ballon d'Or. And is there any funny little stories to stand out? That night was honestly the best night of my life. And for some people, it may not be a big thing. Uh, I have in my bio two times host of the Ballon d'Or because it's my proudest achievement in my career to date. Absolutely. It's amazing. And I still have to pinch myself like I was on the night that I was there, that I was doing that. Um, To do it twice as well was beyond anything I could have imagined. But that first night, it it could never be as special as the first time. And, And I'm sure you can understand that. So I had a dress made for me by a friend of mine in Spain. Because they said, like, we need someone who you can work with who can make a dress. And this is the vision we have. And it's still the best dress I've ever worn. And that includes my wedding dress. I love that dress so much. And so already you're feeling a million dollars. Someone does your hair. Someone does your makeup. And before all that, you've been to meetings in Paris. You've been there a few days, practicing every single day. But then the players and the ex-players start to trickle in to come and see. And you see their names on the seats in front of you. And I mean the biggest names in football so that was the most amazing thing about it and so there was one day on the rehearsal and Pelé just started to come through the door and it's the probably the only time I've ever been truly starstruck because I don't get starstruck and I was I had to take a breath and Rude Hullet my co-host ever the gent he saw how I was feeling and he said oh Pelé we haven't had a picture together for a while let's get a picture cake and you take a picture and then Rude said, you know what, you get in with him as well. I want to take one of the two of yes, you together. Rude. So he did it for me and I got that amazing picture. And so that was just the first of many, so many more happened, which was so funny because when I saw the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano wasn't at my first one, the Real Madrid players didn't come. But when I saw the likes of Lionel Messi. And Wait, what Xavi, year was your first one? What year was your first? Okay, so it, my first one was in 2012, but they call it the 2011 Ballon d'Or because remember it's January and you're looking at the year that's just gone. So it was January Messi and Ronaldo of were really established at that point. Those were, those were the two Huge. best in the world at that That's point. who the fights were between. Yeah. Well, not the fights, but that's who the award was always between. And it's been that way for years. But I would see the likes of Iniesta, Xavi, Lionel Messi, and I was not bothered. I'd seen them so many times at games because I was working for Real Madrid television. I'd seen those guys before. So that wasn't so much of a big deal to me. It was the ex-players, the big legends that I grew up watching. So much so that at dinner that night, because after the Ballon d'Or is the best bit, you have this amazing dinner and everyone's in the same banquet hall. And I sat at dinner with uh, Ruth Hullet and Marco Van Basten. And they started telling stories of Milan in their day. Imagine Matteo. And you know... (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know him that that first year and there's some people on the tables as always that uh, maybe guests of other people that aren't so much a football fan and I was thinking oh my god if anyone speaks and interrupts this conversation I will actually stab them with my fork because this is amazing I, I and you know what was most upsetting that I was there on my own because there's so many people I was thinking where are all my best friends now who love football and would love to be in this conversation? I met Sir Alex Ferguson on the stage. He was so kind to me. He came to ask me where I was from, how I'd ended up here because he heard me speak in Spanish and he could obviously hear I had a Northeast accent. And he thought it was amazing and he was such a gent as well. So there was just all these wonderful stories that night. I will treasure those memories forever. I can't imagine. And it was messy picked up both, right? Both on the second one I did, it was his fourth, which at the time was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And everybody just stood up and he got a standing ovation and I got goosebumps on the stage. It was incredible. 
I'm getting goosebumps even listening to you talking about this. That's an absolute dream. Well done. Now, dream turned into a nightmare in many ways because you interviewed Beckham one time. And this for me, Kay, is one of the funniest stories. Like I, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing this fella in Miami when we were with being Sports and the beautiful smell off him. The look, I wasn't listening to a word Beckham was saying. Not listening to a word he was saying. The handsome devil. Tell us about the time you, you spoke to him. The, the first ever interview that Beckham gave in Madrid when he joined as a Galactico. Yo, so he he'd already been there a while when I got there. My first oh, I'm sorry. was his you got last season. That's all right. No, I didn't. I have, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, I should have, sorry. but I wasn't. Don't worry. I should have, but I wasn't around for it. It was a brilliant person who did it anyway, Reshmin Chowdhury. I was I was on vacation at the time, and it was a bit of a surprise that he came when he did. Um, and she did a wonderful job of it too. Uh, anyway, it was. Um, Dan Thomas, my colleague at ESPN FC, is my own former roommate in Madrid. He and another girl and I all lived together. And when I was newbie at Real Madrid Television, my first season was Beckham's last. And he said, OK, tomorrow I'm going to bring you to training with me. This does mean you're going to meet David Beckham because we have to go and speak to him about a few things. So I said, OK, great. Grown up, obviously, an English football fan. And yeah, I'm going to meet David Beckham. This is amazing. So that morning, I got up really early, doing all my hair, putting my makeup on. What am I going to wear? I've got to make a good impression here. And I started chewing some gum when I was getting ready and just like listening to my tunes in my bedroom in Madrid. So my mouth felt minty fresh to the point where I left the house thinking, you know, usually, you know, if your mouth doesn't feel right, you can. And it took all the way I went, my walk, I got on the metro, I got to work, we got in a taxi to go to Valdebebas where Real Madrid train. And it was halfway on that taxi ride that I had the, oh, I didn't clean my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I must be the only red blooded female in the world who's been pre-warned she's going to meet David Beckham in person today, face to face, and forgot to clean her teeth. So... I was very scared. And when we went into the area where we met him, Dan said, and David, this is our new journalist with us at Real Madrid Television. She's English. Her name's Kay. And I just pushed my hand out like this. <laughs> I, uh... Now in Spain, you give, it, you give everybody two kisses. That's how you greet. It's a great excuse to get two kisses off David Beckham. But I held out my hand. So Dan is just looking at me. I can see him in my periphery, like, and then after David leaves, ever the gent, after David leaves, Dan said, what the hell are you doing? Even he I got said, two what kisses. what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is where he was more annoyed. He goes, you girls in Spain have the opportunity to get two kisses off any of these guys, and you held your hand out English style. What were you thinking? I said, I didn't clean my teeth. <laughs> anyway, don't worry, ladies. And some men. New Year came around when all the players came back. They all came to say hello to us. And I got right in there with the two kisses and made up for it. Bex, you owe me. You owe me, bud. I brush my teeth today. <laughs> so those, those of you that don't know you that are watching on YouTube instead of listening on, on podcasts, when you eat food, Kay, and you're chatting, you always put like a microphone in front of your mouth. Mike. You always talk like this. And I always like, oh, there, there goes the Kay microphone again. So were you doing that when you were chatting to him? I don't think I was at the time, but Kev, I'm just trying to be a lady. The thing okay. is, is as you can tell, we love a chat, don't we? So even when we were eating, what was it, at Chipotle, we'd be going every day. You and I always went for lunch together at Being Sports every day. It was our little escape. But we can't stop talking even when we're eating. So I was like, oh, I can't have a mouthful of food. So I'd put the old microphone on, like the players. Yeah, you and I are now to talk. I think we're now to talk. <laughs> My wife will say the same thing. Although I will say, whenever I chat to you on the phone, Meg sabotages the phone. The other day I'm chatting to you and I'm eager to know how you got on, how was your day? And next thing Meg goes, oh, it's Kay. Get the phone for one sec. The phone's gone. And I had to go down the road. She had to like give me back my phone to call you on her phone. So it's, it's, it's classic Kay though. You're a chameleon in that way because you go from being the, the football fan talking about the industry with me to all of a sudden jumping across talking about, you know, babies and stuff with Meg. <laughs> I've always been that way. And I think it's because I was a huge football fan from being such a young girl, from being six years old. And now it's great because there are so many more female football fans. And in my hometown, there were quite a lot. Even my friends who didn't like football would always know who the borough manager was. You just do growing up in Middlesbrough or the, who the players were. 
But because I loved the new football, I talked to my granddad about it extensively. And the World Cup 1990 came a, a, when I was a very young girl and it was an amazing World Cup for England. The, the lads I could chat with all the time about football. So I think that's one of the things that made me a bit tomboyish in that way. But then on the flip side, like you're saying, I love getting dressed up, putting my makeup on, putting my heels on. I love girly things. And all my closest girlfriends, like all my bridesmaids at my wedding, there's only two of them who are big football fans. Both of them work in the industry. The rest of them couldn't care less really about football. So our friendships have nothing to do with sport. And in a way, that's really nice. But in the other side of things, Kev, it can be where I'm sat with the girls and we're having all these great girly chats and I start to hear the lads' conversation, the debate they're having about football. And it's horrible because I can't tune out of one or the other because I want to be in that conversation, but I want to be in this one too. So that gets me into trouble sometimes. Yeah, because Optic K is sitting there going, he's wrong. What he just said is wrong. <laughs> I need to correct him here. Probably. Probably the case. You know what I'm like with things like that, especially if there's something that I've got a sticking point on, like the fear clause in football, which yeah. I was right on, by the way. Who, who, fear clause we're going to play word association in a sec but who do you think of when i say fear clause who comes to mind well actually i go way back to samuel Eto when we talk okay. about fear clause but um i don't know i'm wondering who you're going to think that i'm going to think of when you say i thought you were going to say clause. maybe me because i'm always the one bringing it up so oh, he's talking about the fear clause i would always i would always think of you on the fear clause <laughs> because so just to, just for the viewer or the listener the baby's crying there sorry he's just woken up from his nap um, is that, it's all right, his dad's there. I'm not just leaving him crying. Is that, um, you know, especially in Spain, that you can't play your parent club if you're on loan. And I always hated that rule. And I understand it, but I hated it. Because I feel that if you're sending a player out on loan, it's to help them develop as a player. So you should let them play against the very best. This, it, it usually would come at Real Madrid. You should be letting them play against you to see how they do against you. And I understand, but it did used to, rile me up Ray Hudson was on my side too with it I'm on your side as well I think sometimes I go back and forth look at Coutinho though scoring two against Barca when he came on recently uh Kay what is your biggest driver in the industry for you what motivates you the most because I often think about this and I don't know for me whether it's being a competitor because I think I, I think I am and naturally in our industry it's such a ruthless industry that you have to kind of be a competitor um is it a love for the industry? Is it a combination of both? Is it a drive for money? What is it that really gets you going in terms of your career? So it might surprise a lot of people. I'm not very competitive. Um, and that's because I grew up with the most fiercely competitive sister. But she always had to win. That My brother and I just conceded defeat in the end. We were like, okay, fine. She'd cheat to win. So we grew up with that. So I think that's where it may have come from. Mine is, and I know you agree with me on this because I know you are the same, Kevin. I just always want to get better at what I do. Big time. I just always, I, I, there'll be, I can have a show where people will go, oh, you nailed that. You were great. And I'm thinking, mm, there's a few little things I would have changed if I could. And so that's one of my driving forces. But the other is that I love the game. And the great thing about working in the USA is that there are so many football fans, you know, so many soccer fans. And you can't get away. Many people be like, oh, they don't know anything about football. They're totally wrong. You can tell anyone who says that has not lived in this country. Because you have to think all the sports that come before are football in this country. And many of these people have still chosen that as their sport. So they know what they're watching, what they're talking about, what they like. But what I have loved doing is bringing the stories, and I still love this, bringing the stories of the sport to a larger audience. And because of the privilege I've had in being a Real Madrid reporter and being at the Ballon d'Or, I'll often have some of these stories that nobody else would be able to have, mm -hmm. and I'll be able to share them. And because I speak another, lang another language and a half, let's say Spanish and Italian, I'll often read stories that maybe isn't getting out there to, maybe aren't getting out there to the bigger audience, and I'm able to tell those stories too. And that is always my driving force too educate people on the storylines of the game that might make them smile and that's what out for me at the weekend again and that is where certain hosts are excellent with segues when it comes to uh, statistics and uh, whatever else i'm not the biggest stats person 
I, I like them if they're relevant and if they add context. But for you over the weekend watching you on ABC talking about uh, whether it was what was the thing about Chiellini again and, and, and what exactly was going to happen. They put down the wrong name or something on the team sheet. And I thought that adds so much context. And there's, there, it's just such a fun little nugget. And it got the best out of Kay. Uh, I was about to say Kay Burley, Craig Burley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, don't worry about it. We'll let you off because for anyone who's watching outside of the UK, there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a news reporter on Sky News in England called Kay Burley. And so we had, we had, actually we had an American producer in our ear, but he said, guys, sorry for the awkwardness, but am I right in thinking that there's a journalist named Kay Burley? Because I was on air with Craig Burley. And we were like, yes, there is. Don't worry. So it's fine that you said that. Really well known as well. No, great stuff, Kayser. Listen, we're going to end this show with word association. I feel I know you pretty well, right? So I've got 10 okay. words. We're going to go rapid fire. I'm going to throw them out and you spit out the first thing that comes to mind. Okay? All right. And I'm going to let you know what I had after that. Okay. Here we go. Janino. Bora? Yeah. Very good. Did you right. have you gotta, that? You, oh, I got middle three. Yeah. Yeah. You got to okay. be a little quicker though. Okay. Here we go. All Pineapple. Right. Not on a pizza. <laughs> See, I have never, pizza. Never, never, <laughs> never on a pizza. Never, ever, ever pineapple on a pizza. Just go to Naples and ask if that's a thing, the home of pizza. You will be told no. You will have the door slammed in your face. There are videos showing you this. Pineapple, never on a pizza. It's disgusting. I actually think you're more passionate about this than anything else in life. Pineapple. Mm-hmm. I think I am too. I think so. Next up, mustache. Dave Murray, my dad. Hey, I had Tom <laughs> Selleck. <laughs> Did you? Do I use Tom Selleck a lot? No, because I was joking on my podcast. So I have a podcast with my husband called Calcio Cast. It's an Italian football podcast. And we were talking about tashes the other day. And my husband thinks that it's strange to just have a mustache and no, no other facial hair. But I don't think that's strange. My dad's had that. And I, in fact, I said that my dad's tash had my dad. Because basically oh, wow. his tash was the was the main part of him. So it was the tash and my dad was attached to it. Did he look so like Pat, Mo- Pat Mustard, the, the milkman in Father Ted? <laughs> 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 All right. It was quite the tash. Who comes to mind? Athlete. Athlete? Yeah. There's so many. I'd say Serena Williams. Oh, love it. Okay. I said Usain Bolt. I thought you might have gone Did Cristiano he- Ronaldo. Usain Bolt would have been in my head because I often use him as an analogy for something if I'm talking about, oh, you did that quicker than this. But for, I love Serena Williams. I'm all about Serena for, for athletes. Next up, bald. Bald? What well, comes to mind? Come on, come on, come on. I don't know. Oh, uh, we, need, we need to get a few more. Yeah, Luigi Colina. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I had unlucky. <laughs> unlucky? Why? I thought you, you were going to say, I thought you were going to say, what? unlucky? <laughs> no, I have to say, I started losing some of my hair after my baby was born, so I'm not going to say unlucky, but that, maybe that was a bit unlucky at the front. I was losing some patches of hair. So I was nursing him, so I think the nutrients were going elsewhere. So yeah, uh, I'm not going to be hating on the bald people. Miami Beach. I feel like saying home, even though it isn't. That's that's fair. Part enough. of it. That's fair. I still have a place there. We still have a place there, and I did. It was my first years in America there. But if you to say Miami Beach, it would be Soho Beach House. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that is went there with you a few times. I had Muscle Beach. I was trying to think. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Miami Muscle Beach. Muscle Beach. When did, it, when did we ever go to Muscle Beach? Well, certainly, I never went to Muscle Beach, but I used to walk by going to Soccer Shape and uh, the, the football fitness class down on the, on the beach. Go check it out. It's really cool. Uh, Do you know what, that, though? Isn't it, isn't it a fun, such a fun place? It is. It's, it's, it is. it's got the parts that like, drive you insane, but Miami is so fun and so colourful. Yeah. There's nothing like it, you know? It's got like that Instagram filter that's just completely bright. You take a picture anywhere <laughs> you don't else. Don't even in the need world. a filter. Yeah. yeah. It's not as bright and sunny. So, no, I loved, we were there four years. What were you there? Seven? Almost eight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, seven, you're right. And do you know what's really funny though? Right when Rebecca Lowe went with NBC, she'd said how surprised she was at how wonderful it was. And she hadn't expected it because I feel that a lot of people who haven't been to Miami, there may be 
there may be a, a view of it that's not so favorable, but to actually go there and to see much more than just Ocean Drive and see other Absolutely. areas there, it's, it's a wonderful yeah. place. Oh, it's beautiful. Absolutely love it. What comes to mind when I say Italian? Italian, my husband. Okay. I and food love, and I pasta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bobo. We love Bobo, don't we? Bobo is for, for everybody listening and watching. Bobo is somebody that instantly it's it's hard to crack the outer shell even though he's very kind to everybody but once you do he's this wonderful friend yeah. and kev obviously you and i know we used to go jogging with him on a morning in miami we got for dinners with him and we've maintained that friendship over the miles now that he's back in italy and what a great person kids, yeah, lovely lovely family over there in yeah the lovely family. wife lovely kids what comes to mind baked beans all right. What, I don't know if you know this about me, but you might. It's very weird how one bean is disgusting. <laughs> Do you know that? No. no. <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> I thought you were going to say apple tartan or Joey Barton, or I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say on That's top. That's you. This I is your realize... word association game. I, this is the word association. Everyone's got a story. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Barton of course I'm a storyteller I told you this Joey Barton apple tart and that's what Kevin says for farting yeah. um, basically no I, what my weird phobia is one bean on its own not any bean a baked bean I, really? it makes me feel a little bit sick I think that when I was growing up once and the table in the house wasn't it had been wiped down and there'd been one bean missed and then we didn't eat at the table for a few days and when we went back in the dining room there was like a crusty bean and forevermore it became disgusting. And people who know that are really mean about it. And they leave like one bean on my plate or send me pictures of one bean. So I thought you knew that and you don't. And I know that's really weird and people are going to think I'm really weird now, but that's one of my phobias. My phobia is the remote volume being on an odd number. Oh, I don't like that either. Don't ask me Somebody why. Somebody put that in my head though. It wasn't you, but I know that in your car, I always felt comfortable. But I didn't feel comfortable with your fuel gauge ever. What's wrong with that? I love a bit of thrill in my life. I'd let it go down to zero, guys, and then see how far I could get before the and the car never cut out. So, all that, you that for me as a Virgo is terrifying. Every time I fill my car, I fill it to max, and if I'm at fifty miles, that's like scary for me. You'll be down to five, and you're not what? even worried. It backfired on me one time though. We went for Chipotle and Starbies. And after you had a recording, so you had to get back. We had like five minutes to get you back and you were going straight into studio. Quick top up with the powder. In you go on air straight away. And uh, we got in and the fuel gauge was at zero. And you were like, ah, Kev, come on, not today. <laughs> not today. That happened so many times. Not just that with you, but because of the, the nature of the business, especially at being sports with so many leagues and so many things to cover and the shows we were doing. I'd get my makeup done in the morning and by the time I'd be going on air at, at seven, I'd be like, my hair's all fallen out. My makeup isn't even done properly right now, but I've got to host this show. So I was used to that. <laughs> you learn to deal with things under pressure when you let the fuel gauge go. That's okay. Karaoke. You're so vain. No way. I had Mariah Carey. I thought you were going to really? say. Really? Kev, listen, you're like a brother to me. You yeah. speak every day, you're like family to us. And I feel that there are certain aspects we're finding out here of my life mm -hmm. that you don't actually know. I love Mariah Carey, I adore her. I grew up listening to her. My sister hates her because of it, because we shared a bedroom. But um, my karaoke song, and Dan Thomas would have told you this because he's my other karaoke friend, is always Carly Simon's You Are So Vain. What's my karaoke song? Your karaoke, well, you've got a few, haven't you? You like you look because you love an Irish song and you love a bit of five mega mix. Kev Egan got got Kev Egan and my bridesmaids at our wedding in Italy. Somehow got an Italian DJ who I don't think think spoke English to play the five mega mix at our wedding. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> get up, sing it, sing it. One, <laughs> two, three, four. I was thinking, what the heck? How have they got this on? But you guys did. Well done. Though. I think we started doing the conga to it too. Uh, Last, oh, my my karaoke song is usually Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart. Really? Yeah, the old school. Kev, that's, very, that's, a very, that's a very brave decision. I know. It backfires. The other one I, I did last night at karaoke was Mr. Brightside. And I was down on my knees giving it socks, but it just goes too fast, too high at times. 
and I made an absolute balls of it. But is there any better song to come on at the likes of a wedding than that? Everybody goes crazy, don't they? I put it on my must playlist at our wedding. The DJ wrote me uh, like a, an email saying, these are 10 songs that must be played. And then you can give us any songs that must not be played. And that was on my must playlist, as was Earth, Wind and Fire, September. Because they're just the songs that everybody loves and everyone goes crazy for. What's that song? Come on. I, I, say do you remember? I, go, go. <laughs> do remember? Oh, listen, you know I know nothing about music. I thought Tony Braxton was oh, a one hit wonder. You are shocking. You're shocking. You're, you, yeah, you thought Tony Braxton was a one hit wonder. I'll say, oh, you know this band or you know this song. Although I have to say, I was raised on music by my mum and dad. So I think I know more also. I often surprise people with my knowledge of music. Yeah. Break my heart. What a there one hit wonder that was. <laughs> Finally, what do you think of when I say jorts? You, horrible decision. I know. Um, jorts, it's, the, it's funny that they're called jorts here in the USA. Jorts, because the, the Americans say jean shorts, jean jacket. It's like, no, jeans are actually den, denim trousers. That's what jeans are. It's a <laughs> denim jacket. It's Sorry. denim shorts. I just got a flashback <laughs> to walking into work the next day after buying them. And it was during the summer. So we had like a summer fun show. So you could kind of wear more casual clothes in. And I was in Aventura Mall where I used to live. And I went into this one shop. And the lad... A, a good shop as well where you thought, okay, if I'm getting something here, I'm obviously sure super thing. cool. They, they were too expensive for me, to be honest. And the lad there was ripped. And he had a great tan. And he was a handsome fella. And he says to me, uh, what, are you, what are you looking for? And I was like... Um, pair of shorts and he goes oh you got to go for these and he didn't say shorts because he would have sounded like a dope like I say he's like oh, these denim shorts are incredible um, these are the ones I go for and he was wearing them now he had really tanned legs he did he have great. the size that you've got though Kev the you've size got some size on you did he, did he have your size no, he didn't have the ties, didn't have the calves, the big, the big legs like me and he didn't have yeah. the white complexion so I thought I look like him. Deadly. Off we go. Here's your $900. I'm only messing. And uh, went into work the next day and everybody just started laughing as I walked in. You were like the ringleader. It's like, nice one, guys. <laughs> don't I think even I was more seat. disappointed. I think I was more disappointed than anything else. I don't, it's, I don't like long denim shorts on a guy. I'm sorry. And Bobo Vieri backed me up and he's Italian and he's friends with Giorgio Armani. So I think that's enough, you know. The amount of times it went And to Howard Webb, the referee, when he came to explain VAR to us on the extra at BN Sports when we were double hosting the summer show, he sent you off. And even after a review with the video assistant referee, they decided that that decision was correct and that it was a bookable offence. I mean, sending it off. was. Yeah. Uh, all red cards are reviewable. And it went to the video assistant referee. And it was a good decision. No complaints about it. I'll never wear them again. I'm keeping them because one day I'm going to frame them and show my son and say, never, ever make that mistake <laughs> live and learn in life Kaiser. and on that note i'm gonna love you and leave you because uh we've been talking mm. for far too long no doubt you and i were always going to be the longest podcast of the series so far so thank you so much for joining me love to you and your amazing family and i'm sure we'll probably end up catching up later today thanks kev let me just say before i go though that i absolutely love the show i'm honored to be a part of it and i love what you're doing with it because it's giving inspiring stories from so many different people in the industry that i look forward to it every week Thank you. Rockstar. Cheers, Kayser. Chat to you soon. Big love, Kayser. That was fun. Really enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for the insights. And folks, let me tell you, in terms of preparation and knowledge and fun, Kay, for me, is the best I've ever worked with. Uh, she's one of those hosts that always make sure her analysts are uber prepared, uh, are completely comfortable in their chair before they go on air. And that makes the big difference between the shows that you think are a little bit clunky at times and those that just run seamlessly with a really good host at the helm. So Kayser is absolutely brilliant. Make sure you're following her on social media at KL Murray. Enjoy the chat. Looking forward to next week's already. Thanks as always, guys, for all the love, whether it's on social media or the ratings and reviews on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform. We'll do it all again next week. Take care.